Okay, so I've answered your questions. Uh, there are two questions about the uh, slides from yesterday. Uh, I will ask to send them to you via the email after the presentation. And if this will not be possible, we will post them on the Slack channel uh, where you are also asked about them. Okay, so the plan for today is to do a quick recap what we've learned yesterday. We're gonna do this in a second. And then we're gonna continue what we stopped yesterday at the end, so how we can customize our uh, with Symfony ways or just with some oral functionalities. And uh, after this, I will present you some practice. So what could be, for example, uh, the business request and how we could handle this. And then we're gonna start entity center data. This is very important topic, which we're gonna cover a lot of custom or uh, functionalities. And this topic will be also continued tomorrow. Okay, so uh, I will start from uh, Reminding you what's the process of the training if we have somebody who wasn't here yesterday. So please let me share, start sharing the screen. And if you could please just let me know if you can see the presentation. Mm, sorry. Uh, yep. Yeah, uh, okay, you can see it. And uh, I see a question from Dennis uh, Young. Uh, you should have received the email yesterday after the presentation and there was a link to the video. And the video, what I've checked, is already uh, uploaded to the location. So if you click the link in the email, you should have the video from yesterday, uh, the session uh, already there. Okay, so just to remind you what the training process, I will try to show you as many examples as it's possible. Uh, some of them you will see the UI, some of them in the code, some of them will be just on the slides. Uh, the slides and the recording will be shared with you so you don't need to uh, memorize everything or try to record it by yourself. Uh, there will be short question and answer section after each topic. And if those will be quick question, I will try to answer all of them. Uh, otherwise, if we will be short on time or if the question will need uh, a little um, research from my side, I will answer them uh, next day or you can post them to the Slack channel or we will have longer quiz and answer session on the last day of the training. Uh, there should be a 15 minute break uh, in the middle of the training. Today we plan only one break. And yeah, I think that's it. So yesterday we talked how we can configure development environment for you. So how can we configure IDE? Which plugins do we use in Aura? Which uh, inspections do we recommend? So it should really speed up the process. It should make your better experience. And actually uh, it should make it just easier for you. So really recommend, try to configure this environment for you and make sure it works. So you make sure you have those suggestions. If you've seen of the video that I have some suggestions and they don't work with you, uh, for you, please uh, share on the chat and I will help you or maybe somebody from the community already had the same issue and will try to help you. Uh, then we talked uh, about the concepts we have in Oro. So what were the reasons to create the platform, how the packages are connected to each other, uh, how do we have approaches to different things like upgrading the application, installing the application, or for example, using crons. And we have a very short talk about the testing where I presented you, for example, how you could run uh, BHAT tests or unit tests. And we started talking about the customization of the platform. And this is where we'll continue today. Uh, just to remind you, there is a Slack channel on the Oro community uh, Slack uh, and if you have any questions you can go there and just ask them and either me or Andre or somebody from the community will try to help you. Mm, okay so let's continue from the yesterday presentation. Uh, I'll just quickly go uh, through the slides we already talked about. So we talked about service uh, overriding the simplest possible way is to just override it by using the same name. It is not extendable and it's important to understand that only the last definition will be used. 
A little bit uh, better approach is to decorate a service. And this way you can create few decorators to the same service and there will be like a chain of decorators with something like sort of a fallbacks. Uh, a little bit more complex method, but gives you a full control over the DI when it's built. It's a compiler passes where you can change the class, add some method calls, work with the tags. So really a flexible solution. And then we talked how we could override part of uh, the system, like the templates, using the application level. So if you put them in the correct uh, directory, which is SRC resources, then name of your bundle, and then views, uh, and so on, you will override it uh, just by using the same path for all the places where it was referenced using this notation, all the old one, which is explained here in the Oro Templates docs. I also showed you how we can override rules or controllers using the controllers YAM, or if the controller was not registered as a service, we could just create a controller with the same root name, or we could override hot controller using the routing YAM. And the last thing I showed you was the template inheritance. So whenever we had a template, and my example was to put it in the SRC resources. And I would like to extend the parent template. I don't want to override it. So if somebody modify, for example, nav button block or page header block, I will have those updates. So if I update the application, I will still get updates for those blocks. I just want to extend it. To do this uh, by overwriting from the application, uh, on the application level, I need to remember about the exclamation mark here. Otherwise, I will point this template to extend your, itself and it will make circular reference and you will have the error. So this exclamation mark means that I'm extending the original template, not the, this one. And thanks to this, I can have block breadcrumbs, for example. I can call parent block, which will be the same block from this template. And okay, this is dummy, but I could add some additional markup. I could uh, call some tweak extension or do anything I want, and then it will just extend my block. And we checked this also on the front store, sorry, on the front of the application. And whenever I go to the user, I have some additional text here. Okay, so I don't need to register this template anywhere. It is extended because I mm, placed the file in the correct directory. Mm, okay, let's continue with the other possible customization ways. So, and this is like the Oro functionality. Up till now, we talked about the Symfony possibilities. Most of those, uh, all of those features were Symfony features, so all those customization you could do in the Symfony. Uh, something that is uh, Aura specific, for example, is a template placeholder. Okay, so we created new token, HTML token, which is called placeholder. It's like new tag to register it. We extended the tweak token parser, and this extension knows about the placeholder and knows how to handle it. And the idea of this placeholder is whenever we create a bundle in Aura, we try to have those bundles as independent as, as it's possible. So for example, you could have products without inventory or without pricing. So product bundle doesn't have to know about even existence of pricing bundle or inventory bundle. Of course, other way around, uh, it's, not, uh, it's not like this. So we have some placeholders. So this is the places in the templates where other bundles can inject something without those two bundles uh, depending on each other. And good example of those is, for example, the data audit. So let me show you how it works. First of all, mm, I will open the view template, but I will open its IDE. It's simpler to read. UI bundle, view, HTML, excuse me. Yeah, there it is. So this is the template that is being extended for the by 
most of the views of other entities. Okay, so whenever I would like to create view for the entity, when I create a CRUD, for example, I usually extend this, um, this template. And here, if you take a look, I will have few placeholder tags, quick tags, okay? So as you can see the placeholder, I will have some name. This is the name of the placeholder. And then I have the keyword with, and I pass an RI or on variables, right? So I have the name and I bind some value to this. And as you can see, there is a lot of placeholders. For example, I have one here in the workflow step container. Then I have in the navigation button container, I have two. One is before and the second one is after the navigation buttons of given entities. And then I have some for the page actions. And this is the one we're gonna talk uh, at this moment. Uh, placeholder called change history block, okay? And as you can see to this placeholder, I'm passing quite a lot of uh, values. So I'm passing the entity, I'm passing the class, I'm passing the ID separately, the title, and the path and the history, okay? So I just defined some place in this tweak template and right now it's empty. But there is a definition and I can add something to this place. Okay, so I registered a placeholder and then from different bundles, as you can see, for example, here it's data audit bundle. I would like to add something to this placeholder. So I create a placeholder CM file which is Oro specific uh, file. As you can see, it is config Oro, which means that it will be auto discovered. Okay, so as you can see, uh, it's like a navigation or uh, any menu structure. So I have some items, uh, sorry, the placeholders, and I have some items where to use them. So I created two items, for example, change history link, and that audit condition, for example, and then I would like to add them. So I have the placeholder, I have the name of the placeholder, which is change history block. As you remember, this is the name from here, change history block. So to this placeholder, I would like to add something, and I'm injecting the item, change history link, which is this item. It means that in this placeholder, I will render this item. This item has some template, which we're gonna take, uh, check in the second, and it have the condition, so when this should be applicable. So, because all of my entities extend uh, this default view, I would by default add this to all the entities views, but some, some of the entities uh, may not have that audit, for example. So I am able to specify some conditions when this uh, item should be added to the placeholder or where it should not. For example, uh, I have, I, I check if data audit is enabled for given entity. And using this special notation, I have access to the variables that were bound to this placeholder. So for example, by this entity, I have access to this value, right? And also you had the values added short change history and I have the access to this. So those values can be different for each entity, but I have access to them in the placeholder. And also I can check some ACLs. We're gonna talk about ACLs on next Tuesday, as I remember. So if I have uh, permission to this actually or data audit view, I will see this uh, item, otherwise it will not be rendered. And now how the template looks like. It's a typical Twig template. And inside of this Twig template, I have the access of those uh, variables. So actually what this does, it displays the change history link. It's this button, okay? So I do not know uh, about user bundle inside that audit bundle, but still I'm able to add some functionality to user bundle from that audit bundle. Okay, this way I can inject some um, templates, some pieces of functionalities to other bundles without coupling them. Uh, it might not see like the obvious solution right now, but it's really useful and uh, in many cases 
uh, one of the simplest way to customize or to add something. And as you can see, there is quite a lot of those uh, placeholders and they are not only in the view uh, page. So in all those places, for example, if I would like to add additional button, so navigation buttons, sorry, are here. It have, if I would like to add some additional button, you can see there are placeholders to add them before the existing buttons or after the existing buttons, okay? And so on and so on. There is quite few of those placeholders. And again, we have placeholders for the page header stats. Those are here. And I can add before and after them. And for the activities, we're not gonna talk about activities, but this additional tab here. Okay, so quite quite a few of those. And of course, you could create a, your custom view template or override this existing one and add some more placeholders if you uh, have such a need. So this is a good place to define some place in your template and on some conditions, if they are met, you can inject different tweak templates from other places if, for example, given functionality is enabled or you have uh, just uh, permissions to use it. Mm, excuse me. Then we also use a lot of tweak extensions, okay? So probably you know a few of them, like the trans, it, uh, the very popular one. So there are filters and the functions. <laughs> there is actually pretty uh, few articles about the difference between filter and the function. So uh, it's actually really about to the developer to have this uh, small difference between, uh, so filter, if you want to just change the value or change how you present the value and the functions, if you need to, do something with the values, but they are really similar. And of course, you can register your own functions. Uh, and this is pretty nice because you don't want, of course, obviously you don't want an application or business logic inside the templates. And if you need to call it, you could run it in the tweak extension, which would actually execute some providers, some other service. So the logic is still uh, in the PHP and the tweak only gets the uh, final value and displayed. Uh, then, of course, you can also test some values. The most popular test in Twig is check if this is defined. So like it's PHP is set, for example. Uh, we have some operators like to compare the values. And we have some globals, but in most of the cases you want to avoid them as the same as with the PHP globals. And for example, in the practice uh, for this topic, you will be asked to extend something called name provider, which is uh, Twig extension. And also there is an entity extension. So how does it work? Uh, you have uh, a method called the get functions or get filters. And here you register the functions and you register filters. So right now in Twig, I could use or format name. So let's take a look and it will call get entity name from this filter, uh, sorry, from this extension. So I can find get entity name. As you can see, it's using the service, get entity name resolver, and getting the name for given object in given locale. So let's find it. Let's find the use of it in ID. Yeah, can be this one. Okay, you see I'm displaying some value and then I'm adding the filter or a format name. And if I have everything properly configured, I can click and go to check what it means, what will be called whenever I use this filter. Okay, so there's pretty lot of those filters and also, excuse me, you should have hints for them. So if I go pipe, I have hints for the filters. Okay, so the names are pretty explanatory. For example, if I would like to display this as percent value, uh, I should have or a format percent and what additional arguments I can pass. If I use it, I can go and check how it works. Okay, so there are 
different tweak extensions. And this is also a good way to customize something or if you need to use some business logic, you should not put it in the template. You could create a tweak extension that will use some other services and still the logic is out of the template. Now again to Symfony way, so there are form extensions. As you know, this uh, Symfony handles, form, uh, so, sorry, handles forms pretty well. This is really complex functionality with a lot of uh, components, a lot of uh, possibilities to customize it further. So for example, again, if we think about uh, bundles that are not binded together, for example, we have products and we have inventory. We our store our commerce doesn't have to manage inventory you want to sell something uh, and you don't care about inventory so the product form shouldn't have inventory uh, components out of the box only you should add them if you enable inventory functionality for example right so in this case you should create an extension in the inventory bundle like in this uh, example and if the inventory is manageable you can add something to the form. So let's see it from the ID. How do you use a uh, form extension? First of all, you should not use classes uh, extendability. You should uh, go with the Symfony way. So you extend the, for example, abstract app extension, and then you specify the starting function get extended type. So this change in previous version of Symfony, it was get extended type and you were only extending one type. Right now you can have some generic extension and extend few types uh, at the same moment. So you return an array of the types that you want to extend. And the same goes to the definition of the extension here. So I point to the class, I have to tag it with the form type extension and point which type I extend. Okay, so right now I know that the, whenever I load the product type, I will look for the Symfony, will look for the extensions and will uh, process the build form of this extension after loading the product form and will add the manage inventory field. Okay, so this is a simple uh, example, but really extending form is something that you're gonna probably use on every project whenever you want to customize uh, our application. You will add some custom fields, you will have some custom logic. So we follow the Symfony way if you would like to read, there is a really robust documentation on the Symfony uh, forms. Another uh, example could be that we also can change how we submit the data. So, as you know, the uh, Symfony forms have the list, has the listeners like post data, uh, post submit, pre submit, or pre set data, as I remember, and you could add some events to them and check some conditions, for example. So right now, as I told you yesterday, uh, there is a connection between the customer and the, uh, and the account. And here we are checking, uh, this is the customer form, and we are checking if we have the account associated or we should create one. So once we set the data, we can check some values. So the, we have access to the event, in the event we have access to the data, which is the entity bound to this form, and also we have access to the form, so we can really uh, manipulate it uh, in quite flexible way. The rest of the extension is exactly the same. So uh, you extend abstract type extension, and you point which uh, form types you would like to extend. Also, you could just modify the existing behavior. So you could, for example, remove existing fields, add some additional fields, or check. Uh, we're not gonna uh, cover this, but we have something like it's called feature toggle bundle. You can check it. This is pretty nice bundle that allows you to check if some features is enabled or is disabled. So to use it, let me show it in ID. you will tag your service with specific feature toggle feature, and this is the name of the feature. So this service 
whenever you check inside for the is feature enable, it will return the status of this RFP. So if you enable a request for uh, proposal or we disable it. Okay, so this way you can check if this extension should be applied or not. Also, uh, pretty, pretty good way to customize something depending on other uh, configuration. The same uh, extension works uh, as in two previous examples. So we point which form type should be extended. Yeah, this is the link to Symfony documentation. We're not gonna follow this, it's pretty, pretty large. Uh, then, this is something we mentioned yesterday. You can, of course, change the configuration files and this is uh, how you also change the behavior of the application. So you have the global config YAML, but you also can use the app YAML in the bundles. What is the logic of using app YAML in the bundles? First of all, it could be treated as a default value for uh, specific settings. But also, let's think you would not have this app YAML. You create some bundle, and these custom bundles have some settings, and you put it in the config YAML, okay? But the config YAML is not part of the bundle. So whenever you would like to share this bundle, you would need to remember that part of this bundle, which is the configuration, is in the config YAM. So you need to always remember to copy this. Whenever we put this inside the bundle, the bundle is, you can copy it as it is, and you will have the functionality working for you. So this is pretty, pretty uh, good idea to put some configuration then if you need them, uh, or if you need to override something. So whenever you move your bundle, you will not have to remember about copying some values from config YAM, for example. And there's a comment to check the config. Excuse me. Hey, why can't I copy this? And here I can check the, I need to add uh, the, the name and I will check the values of specific config. Okay, so the example could be the, for example, I can configure the tweak. So I can configure which uh, action should be used to uh, display the uh, exceptions or I could create a file inside my bundle and modify some behavior. So I have CMS bundle, and for CMS I can define some additional uh, image types, or I can uh, use, uh, define what uh, HTML purifier should be used for all of forms. Okay, so I install the bundle and the configuration goes with it. So I don't need to remember about moving some additional values. Also, there is a lot of events. Really, whenever we think about some new functionality, we think that uh, in what way we would like to extend it. So for example, what could be business use cases? And then we add events. So before or after we process some data, there is an event, you can modify the data and you don't need to override the, the class. So you can just create an event listener and using the event data, modify it and then return it. So, you just modify the data and then it's being processed or you just modify it after being processed. Uh, so this allows you to change the default behavior or even the data. And a good example could be, for example, data grid. So we're gonna talk about data grids today, uh, sorry, tomorrow actually. And as you saw in Oro backend, we use them really a lot. So, Data grid is just a way to present some uh, inform information. So this is the data grid. Okay, so we defined how this should get the data. We define the columns, we define the filters, and most of the configuration can be done from the YAM files. But sometimes you need to modify either the configuration or the results after they are being fetched from the database, and then you can use the events. So there is actually a section 
uh, events for the data grid documentation. So to find them, I just type Oro platform data grid events, and it is here in the first place. And here I can check what events are being dispatched for this uh, data grid. I can see that there is a build before and build after events, and the same goes for the results. Okay, so result before and result after. Here's an example how it looks from the code. So there is a builder inside the data grid bundle. As, as you can see, there is a build method and here I dispatch the event build before, which have the access to data grid and the config. Then I process the configuration and I dispatch the event build after. Okay, and this is similar to uh, many other components. For example, I can uh, change the search or the indexation the same way using events. So I have some configuration and for example, I would like to check some values or so if something is enabled in the system and based on this, modify this configuration, I can do this with the events. Uh, we also have UI events. You're gonna uh, show, I will, sorry, I will show it to you. Uh, in the practice session in a moment. And of course, you can use doctrine events like lifecycle listeners. And for example, the, the obvious uh, way is to set created, updated at dates for your entities. And also all the symphony events like the kernel request or form events. All of those, of course, are available in Aura. So to summarize, what are the best practices? It's faster to override the service instead of uh, fixing the argument with compiler pass. So if I don't need to do something fancy, it's okay to override or to decorate. So compiler pass is really flexible way, but it's also more complex and it's not that easy to find. For example, if I look for the service by the service name, I will find when it's override. In compiler passes, it's not that uh, obvious. Uh, you may enable auto writing and auto configuration for your application and in the practice that I'm going to show you in a second, you will see it, how it works. Uh, we do not use bound inheritance. I didn't even mention it because right now it's deprecated or I think even removed from Symfony, so we, there is no bound inheritance anymore. Uh, if you need to overwrite only one root, you can just create a new controller and define it with the same root name. And that's it. You don't need to overwrite uh, the routing YAM. You don't need to overwrite controllers YAM. It will just work by the root name. If you need to override the whole controller, you can extend it and then just check one action or you can just create completely new controller and overwrite it with the controller YAM mm, as a service. If this was not defined as a service, you would need to work with the routing YAM. And the last one, really remember, you, don't, you do not want to put any business logic to the template. If there is such a need to, and you have some value in the tweak and need to work with it, you could create the tweak extension, which would be like the proxy and calls the real service implementation in the backend. Okay, guys, now we can have like five minutes for the question and answers. And we will start the topic about the uh, entities. Sorry, I will show you the practice first. Then we will start the topic about the entities and the data. I think in like one hour we will make a break and then we'll continue. Uh, so let me check if there are any questions already. Uh, just to remind you, uh, the chat is just for the discussion and I will mostly focus on the question answer tab. So if I didn't answer something, in it, sorry, I just don't have the time to read it all. I'm checking mostly the question answer tab. Okay, Karim, you mentioned that you do not have Slack, so email would be nice. Okay, uh, I, will, I will check this today with the team and uh, we'll find some solution, no problem. As I understand this about the slides. Could the Slack channel be posted here, please? I couldn't find it yesterday. Sure, let me just copy this for you. And I will post it in the chat. If you run Oro Commerce on Prot and running only one queue, I can see that Oro app required to have a system for PHP installed, but nothing about this. 
Alexander, I'm not sure what you mean actually. Uh, please post your question to the uh, Slack channel and we can continue, okay? And usually and actually always on production, you have uh, one queue but few extensions, uh, extenders, and then a lot of consumers. Usually you do not run only one consumer on production, if this is what you meant by one queue. Question about templates block. How would you go about using the same block twice on a page? And uh, what would be the, the use case? Would you like to reuse it or Nikon, for example? From what I remember, the block name is unique. So you could import it as a different name. As you can see, for example, we import macros. And when you import something in Tweak, you specify how do you import it. Okay, so you import this as uh, UI or U. So in this case, maybe you could import this twice. I'm not sure if this is what you mean. Uh, okay, Marcos, can you please explain to us what and why blocks for the tweaks? They seem to be incredibly complicated. So tweak is a templating system choose by uh, recommended by Symfony and uh, remember. And yeah, at the very beginning, it is uh, a little bit com uh, complex. If you work with it just for a while, you will really find it a nice and convenient way to extend and to reuse some uh, parts of the blocks, okay? And I was also against using some uh, templating systems uh, back a few years ago, like I was uh, playing with Smarty or with Blade, but with the tweak, uh, actually, I really like it. It took me a while to understand why this is better. And right now, uh, I use it every day. And yeah, I'm really happy about it. What does uh, tilde mean in the YAM files? It's empty. For example, here in the services, if I'm looking for the scalar value, I could put tilde. Or if I'm looking for the RI, empty RI, I could put empty RI. Okay, so if I don't, if I want to have it, but right now I don't have the value for it, uh, I could use still dialect like, for the empty value. Where in a custom bundle are you supposed to write filters and function in the entities? No, no. Uh, if you mean filter and function for the tweak, uh, you will have this uh, example, I think, today or tomorrow during the practice session. No, you create specific tweak extension, you tag it, or if you have auto configure enabled, it's automatically tag, and that's it. You do not put them in the extensions, uh, in the entities. Uh, Roberto. Uh, sorry guys, I'm not trying to read uh, some of your surnames. It's just easier for me this way, so I hope you're fine if I'm just losing your first name. Uh, I just asked yesterday in a Slack about the form extensions. Seems like now the fields added to entity by migration are added automatically to the form. And if we need to modify it, we need to add is dynamic field configuration in the form extension. But that is not documented anywhere. Do you know why? Uh, so Roberto, uh, it's added automatically in the migration if you specify the uh, correct owner, like the custom, not system. We're gonna cover this actually today. Uh, and yes, if you would like to override the field that was automatically added, you can do two things. First of all, you can modify the migration. I will show you how to disable the field as a dynamic field and then create your own field in the extension or just add this flag is dynamic field to your form extension. Uh, I will check with the team to add this to the documentation. It's actually uh, quite a new feature. I think it was added in 4.1.1 or even 1.2. Uh, JP, excuse me, I couldn't assist it yesterday. Where can I find yesterday's session record? So uh, as I understand, JP, this is the same place to put all the recordings. So as you are attending today, after the webinar, you will have the uh, email. And in the email, there is a link to the places where all the recording will be posted up to 24 hours after the session.
Why is not enabled without worrying by default in the Serum application, for example? Uh, so, Roberto, first of all, it would take a lot. It would take a lot of time, but also uh, Symfony doesn't recommend this for the bundles. Sorry, for the applications with a lot of bundles. So, we are, right now we are not going to change uh, the services to use auto wiring or auto configure. We have some aliases, so it should be easier for you to use it. Uh, but in Oro, they will be not used at the at the moment. Okay, Karim, um, pagination block, for example. Um, okay, Nico, I, I will check this. Let, let's please continue this uh, discussion on the Slack channel, okay? About the reusing the block with the same name. Mm, seems like Slack is not very active. Some questions are never answered in their plan to be more active there. I'm actually I'm surprised with this uh, because uh, whenever I check this uh, community Slack, the answers are really often posted in the same day or day after. So um, if you just ping with your question, maybe somebody just skipped it or it was not seen by uh, one of the community team. So please just uh, point to the question you have in mind and we'll try to answer this. Is it recommended to group all front-end UI modification in the single bundle for reuse? Akavicia. Uh, so this is really, as I said yesterday, this, this is up to you. Uh, if you have not that many customization, you could create APP bundle and modify everything there. For me, as most of these uh, projects have uh, more than few customization, it's better to create separate bundle and inside the bundle modify uh, what you should modify from the original bundle. From the UI, it's not that obvious. So for example, if this is like your new theme, you could for sure create a theme bundle and this theme bundle do all the UI modifications. It's really up to you how you divide it logically. Just find the way that works best for you or your team actually. Hello, could you just explain why you did yesterday about override user controller and how can... Okay, so uh, for user controller, I've checked two things. First of all, uh, okay, I, had co I have customization for Acme configuration controller and for the user controller. I found the user controller and it was not created as a service, so I couldn't just override the uh, controller CM. All I wanted to do actually is to override this one action. So I create any controller, like ECMI controller is good uh, enough, or of course not in the, <laughs> in the real application, then your controller name should be meaningful. I registered in the routing YAM, okay? And I just reused the same name. So Aura user index. Mm. Let me show it again in user controller. So it was actually the index section. You see, Aura user index. Before my bundle is being loaded with higher priority, so it's later than the original user bundle, my root will be used. It's just overwritten by the root name. Uh, Robert, will the recorded be downloadable? Um, honestly, I don't know. I haven't checked. I just saw that they are there and uh, they are available and you can listen to them online. Uh, I will check for you. And the last question. Why did Oro choose to use jQuery in the front end instead of something modern or stylish that all the kids know? <laughs> Okay, so you need to remember, Marcus, that the Aura is not uh, that new system. We already created for a couple of years, like uh, commerce is the newest product, but we were choosing it for the platform. And then we choose uh, jQuery and the Backbone because those were very popular at the moment. There were planned to uh, play with different uh, JS frameworks and there were even some proof of concepts done. Maybe in the future we will uh, start using the other one or uh, create headless for this. Uh, 
Okay, and the really last one, guys, because we have to continue. About the JS files, I have been having tons of issues running bin console or assets install. Wow, okay, so it shouldn't be like this. First of all, please check the permissions you have. So uh, please type symphony file permissions and it will show you what permissions to directories you should set. Uh, then, in my opinion, it was always faster to just remove the cache. So I'm not using the cache clear. I'm running rm minus rf cache, uh, var cache, and I'm removing the directory. Then I just auto assets install. Also, please remember that if you are working locally and this is development time, uh, it's better to install with the sim links. So whenever you modify the assets, you will see the results instantly without having to rebuild the assets. Uh, Okay, and also there is an asset builds command that will build the assets with, with the webpack for you. Uh, okay, uh, thank you guys for the questions. It's really important that you have questions, that you ask them. And now I will show you the short practice and we'll continue with the, another theory. And the solution for this practice, you. Okay, thank you guys. Sorry, whenever I was uh, dragging the panel, I click mute. So I will start again. I will just, uh, can you confirm that you hear me now? Okay, perfect. Uh, oh. <laughs> uh, so we will be the functionality that will uh, help us mm, to know how we can call specific person. So for the user entity, we have this parts of the name. So we have name prefix, we have first name, middle name, last name, and the suffix. And right now we will build the entity called user naming, and it will tell us how we should call this person. If it should be official, for example, Mr. John Doe, or would be super friendly, like, hey John. Uh, so just the first name. Okay, so this is what will be start of this practice. And in Oro, which we will also cover today, we do not use two string method to represent entity with a string uh, value. We have something called name providers, which are a little bit more complex, but give you way more uh, flexibility, okay? And also I mentioned that you can find the solution to all those practices in the Git repository. So uh, whenever you install, you started from training start branch and there are 4.1 slash training step one, training step two, and so on up to 10, as I remember. And those are the branches with the solution to next practices. So the very first practice would be create training user naming bundle. Then we should decorate the name provider. And whenever we want to display a uh, name for the user, we display this in the hard-coded format. Yes, we will start from the hard-coded because we, will to, we want to build on the solution. And there is an optional part to add this information uh, to the user view page. Okay, so how, we, how do we start? Let's close everything. I have the solution already here, but you will start from going to the SSC directory, creating the namespace, bundle, and the name of your bundle. When you have the directory, you create the bundle file, which is required, just typical Symfony way, 
just extend the bundle and then you create resources config oro and put bundle yams although the other files were just for the demonstration purposes i do not need them at the uh, at now for now okay in this bundle yam i have the bundles namespace and i just register my bundle so i don't have to add it to the app kernel or anywhere in the symphony i just put it here and thanks to the oro distribution bundle it will be auto registered with this specific priority once i've done this i really recommend you to remove the cache because you created new bundle and will not be that is auto discovered and then go to your application open the profiler and it up click the configuration here on the left and search for your bundle if this is here you can user naming if this is here you can continue with customizations otherwise check probably you have some typos uh, and so on because if it's not here it will not be recognized by symphony and your customization just won't work and you will be frustrated which we all want to avoid once i done this i know that let me show you the practice again i should find this uh, service entity name provider from the local bundle let's copy this sorry find by the class lookup uh, I can go to the service definition and this is the name of the service okay now I would like to add services to my bundle we follow the symphony way so I'd add them to the config not to the config or a directory and I need to register them so I create dependency injection directory and I create the extension by default if you don't want to write anything the name of the extension is the name of the bundle but you change the postfix bundle to the extension and this is meaningful if you have typo it will not be auto recognized so this is first thing to check if your service is not being loaded you can put some dummy values here and if the error is not uh, visible it means that your services are not being read in the extension you just load your services okay so this is how you start with the services here as i mentioned we would like to show you that auto wiring is uh, possible to use so i have this uh, default auto wire true and because i would like to use class name i start from creating an alias so the or okay entity name provider name is now aliased with the fully qualified class name as the symphony recommends for auto wiring and i would like to decorate this service to decorate it in the proper way i would need to decorate all the public methods so as you can see i have the get name and the get name dql public methods so i need to either create a, some customization there or i will just need to point to the original service okay so i create a service i mean i created the file already it's in the provider entity name provider decorator i point to what service i want to decorate so entity name provider from the local bundle and as an argument i just pass the original service as we discussed yesterday symphony by default takes the name of the decorator dot iner and this is how you uh, access the original service and i have to tag it with the name provider here inside i have very simple uh, uh, methods so first of all i have the constructor where i get my original provider and store it to the private property and i have two methods i want to customize only get name so first i can go to the other public method which is called get name dql and just return the fallback to the original uh, provider method okay so i do not customize anything i do not decorate anything for this method but for the get name as you can see i have the access to the entity and as i told you we are looking for something very simple not sophisticated yet at the moment even hard coded so i check if the entity is instance of a user if yes i return in the format that was required here last name first name middle name otherwise i 
return the original provider. So I return the original functionality. Uh, it's pretty nice uh, that in your IDE, if you check if something is instead of a user, then inside this loop, IDE knows that this is already a user entity. So he will give you the hints for the methods for the user entity. It would work the same way if I, for example, go with the annotations. So this is also very useful. I have entity. As you can see, I do not have the type hinting here. So my ID don't know what to hint for me because he have no idea what this variable is. So I can just add annotation, then this entity. I'm sorry. And then I have hints for the user entity, okay? And sometimes it's really useful. And also, if you check if this is instead of specific entity, it will give you a hint. And yeah, let's check actually. So right now, if I go to the view page of specific user, this is where the name is being displayed, for example. So let's add Mr. John. Patrick Junior. As you can see, I display them in the correct order. If I try and change the order here, so it should be first name first. it would work. Of course, the better way, it would be just uh, put a breakpoint here, like I did, enable the xdebug, let's do it quickly. Check if the connection is listening is enabled. And same here, I can refresh. It will always take a while, as I told you, with the xdebug, it is slower, but it's already here, and I can check what are the variables, what are the uh, values for all of those and display them in the proper uh, order, for example. And I can continue uh, debugging. Okay, let's disable the xdebug again and continue. So the last thing, and this is something that is not very obvious, as I told you uh, during the presentation, we have also UI listeners. So the last um, point, it's about adding block to the user view page and render there the full name and the all name parts. And actually the block is already there. This is here. So I could do this in a few ways. First of all, I can override the template, but as I told you, this is not the best way because I can lose some updates from the uh, core updates. If I need to update, if I will update Oro uh, core, if I overridden the template, I will not get the new template from Oro or from any other vendor. So I can also uh, use it, um, something we call scroll data listener. So how does it work? Uh, as I told you, this view page uh, extends the original view, but let's find it. So it's user bundle, view, HTML twig, this is actually the my template, but here we have the blocks, but also at the very end, we have the ID. And this is true for the view and for the edit pages. And the notation can be camel case and can be snake case, so you should always check. And right now I know there is a user view ID for this specific template of the, for this entity. And there is a UI extension which have uh, method scroll data before. As, as you can see, it dispatches the event called Oro UI scroll data before and the page identifier. So in my case, it will be Oro UI scroll data before user view. So this is the event name and I can create a listener for it. Uh, so I have event listener, I created the listener and I registered it with the tag for specific events. So this is the 
prefix and this is the ID. Okay, so there is a, this is a kernel event listener and it should call on user view. This is an example when exdebug is really nice because I just point and I will know exactly what I have the event, what are the values and what I can do. But the idea here that I have the access to the entity and I have the access to the rendered HTML, HTML blocks. And I can, for example, get quick environment and render some additional template. So in this case, I created a very simple template Okay, it just gets the properties and displays them and exactly as you see them in the block. So it's a full name and then the parts of the name, so prefix and so on. And now in my listener, I bind the entity user to this template. I render this to the variable and add it as additional block to this template. Let's actually let's debug it. Oh, sorry. Mm -hmm. This is the previous breakpoint. Okay, just a moment more. Okay, and here we are. So we have the event. We can check what is inside. We have the access to the environment. So thanks to this now we can get environment when we have access to tweak. We have the entity, so access to the entity that we are seeing on the view page, and we have the scroll data. So scroll data is the array of blocks. As, as you can see, the user view page contains uh, general information, activity, additional information, and all of the application blocks. And those are here the sections for so the titles and the sub blocks I have inside. So thanks to this, I can add additional block to any section I would like in any order I would like. So as you can see, I create an add additional sub block to the block with ID zero, so the first block, and just render the specific template inside, and that's it. Okay, so thanks to this, I did not overwrite anything. If there will be updates from oral template, original template, I will have it, and still my block will be added to the correct place. Uh, so this is additional way, and this is how you can modify the view and the edit templates. Uh, okay, that's it from the practice part. We will now start the entities and their data theory, and then we will do a very short question and answers where we will ask about also this practice, and a break in like half an hour, and then we will continue with the entities and the data. The error is here because I stopped the uh, xdebug and it's my request. Okay, so entities and their data. This is one of the most important topics because well, not all, but really majority of the application, it is based on the entities, right? Entities store the information for us and then we work with this information. We add some additional functionalities, but they all are based on some data. So. What is the entity? In Symfony, it's just a PHP class or object. Sorry, end object. And it's used to map data by ORM. Okay, so in, in ORO, we use annotations to add the columns, information, and uh, all those for required for ORM. Entities have related repositories. Even if you do not have the custom repository, there is also always the default one with those four magic methods. Find one, find uh, all, find by and so on. And you define the metadata using doctrine annotations. 
uh, they may contain some storage logic, but they never should never contain any business logic. As I said yesterday, when you say never, of course you can break it. You just need to understand why you do this and if this is really a good idea. And then may contain lifecycle callbacks. This is very nice because you do not have to create a listener. You just uh, add annotation has lifecycle callback. And then for the setter, for example, or some other method in the entity, you can use the prepare this pre-update uh, events. And this method will be automatically executed on those lifecycle callbacks. If you haven't worked with this, I really recommend checking them. It's a very simple way to update some values automatically. For example, this created or updated at uh, stamps. And usually in, in Oro, in this, I think it's 100% uh, cases, we store them in the bundle entity subdirectory. So, for example, group entity. We have entity, group, we have the annotation, this is the entity. If there is a custom repository, we point to it. We specify that this is table with the name. We can have some additional constraints on indexes here. Uh, and then we have some aura things like config. We're going to talk about them today. And then we have properties, which usually are columns for the entity. And then we have the entity repositories, and they are used uh, to find those specific entities with, by key or by different uh, other different uh, values to, via the ORM. They may contain custom methods, and in many cases they will. For example, by default you can find by specific conditions, and you would like to make this query uh, a little bit more sophisticated with some joins and uh, even some aggregations, then you will create a custom uh, method in your repository and just call them whenever you, you need them. Usually we store them in the entity repository. So for example, here you saw we have the group entity and the group repository is in the same directory, the subdirectory for the repository. And this is where we have it. And we need to add the information to the annotation which points to it. And this is important. They have to be has to be requested from the entity manager. We do not use repository as a service in Oro. We had some uh, issues with it, especially when we were running uh, message queue and uh, the application at the same time. There were some uh, sometimes not like conflicts but uh, data issues. Uh, default repository that if you do not use custom, it's always entity repository. And also Symfony gives you a, a way to customize it. For example. You have the entity, user entity, and there already is repository defined. And as you can see, we have the fully qualified class name here. So I would not be able to create overwrite it from my bundle on any way. So for this, we have class metadata uh, event listener, and it is executed whenever we build metadata for all the entities. Then we can check if the entity is entity I would like, and I can overwrite the repository or indexes for this specific entity after it is taken from the annotations. So it's not very commonly used, but in many cases you would like, whenever you would like to add some custom methods to the repository that is already custom, you can do this uh, using this listener. You create a new repository that extends the, the one that is already there, and you point that this one should be used. Uh, okay, so the very quick quiz for those of you that already spent a while with the symphony. If I would execute this, it's only like 30 second questions. If you can, you can post the answer to the chat. What will be the result of this call? I get doctrine, I get the manager repository for this entity and find all. Okay, I'll register from our config and okay, let's not waste time. Actually, yeah, usually whenever I ask this question, the obvious answer is all the entities from the uh, config uh, or the other records from the config entity. And let's call this. So I have this ECMI controller. Of course, this is not a good place to call it, but it's simplest uh, to execute it right now. 
So I will just copy this. And it's in the user viewport. I repeat, this is not a good place to call such a method. And Oh, sorry, it's in the index. My mistake. Oh, this error is 500. So the entity config was not found in the chain configured namespaces. Okay, what does it mean? It means that the default entity manager that we got this way have no idea about the config entity. Okay, and this is because in Aura we use few entity managers. Uh, to have few different connections. For example, the, there is a separate entity manager for the message or for the config, so I can get them without uh, disturbing other connections. So they are used to manage the ORM data and each entity manager can have registered different entities. And they have different connections to the database. And because of this, you always have to request the entity manager from the manager registry and it will return the manager that handles this specific entity. So this is how it's configured. As you can see, I have ORM entity managers. There is a default one and it's a separate one for the config. Uh, actually, it's very simple to change this and you just need to remember, okay? So let's continue. This is the result we got. There is, it's not found, there is an error. So there are two ways to handle this. First of all, you can use manager registry. So you get the re manager for this specific entity. You can use the short annotation or you can use a fully, quali fully qualified class name, sorry. And then from this specific entity manager, we get the repository and we can find. So thanks to this, we will get the entity manager that's responsible for handling this specific entity. And the other way, and this is actually the way I prefer, we have something called Doctrine Helper, which is just uh, uh, extending the registry. And here I can get, get entity repository and just find. Okay, so we just sim uh, shorter notation, that's it. But it, in the background, it does exactly the same thing. So here, just to remind you, you should always work with this. So if you need to get entity repository, you get it this way. And now we will uh, talk about two uh, really oral custom functionalities. One is entity configuration. The other one is extensions of entity. So we needed uh, a way to configure entities uh, like and globally. So we have some values, for example, if this entity should be auditable. So should I track the changes to these, these entities? Or should it have attachment? Uh, some other things. So by default, there is not such functionality. So we created something called entity configuration. In many bundles, we have uh, entity config yam, and this is the place where you define specific namespaces and the fields for configuration. For example, let's open the data audit bundle we already seen. Um, of course, I want to remove this first. And in this entity config yam, I have two main keys. Uh, sorry, here. Data audit, and then I have entity and the fields. It defined what I can configure per entity and what I can configure per field. And then I have the items. Uh, sorry, here. I have the key auditable. So for entity, I can specify if this is auditable and the type of this is Boolean. So this is auditable or not. And the same goes for the field. So I can enable the auditable, so that audits for the whole entity and then just disable it for the specific fields. Also, I have some additional fields here, for example, form type. And this is because I can modify this configuration from the UI. So let me demonstrate here. 
let's refresh this it should work already and here in the system configuration i sorry system uh, i have entity management this is the very good place to check all my entities and let's check the contact entity why not i have the contact entity here i can check all the fields with, with the types that i have for this entity and also i can edit the entity itself and here i can see what activities are being enabled for this uh, entity if this has attachment or not and also if this is auditable or not as you can see it's displayed as a drop down with true false and it is because here where i created the definition of this data audit uh, configuration i said that the form type should be choice type with just values yes or no okay so right now for all the entities i can configure of course you will not do this uh, through the ui you can then modify it if you need to you will do this from the code perspective so you will found find the contact entity from the contact bundle and here as you can see we have default uh, doctor annotation entity the table we enable the lifecycle callbacks and then we have the config annotation Next and here for the config i have some root uh, roots we're going to talk about them tomorrow and i have default values for default values i have the namespace as you remember our namespace here was data audit so i can check that audit it is here and for the entity i had only one field which was called auditable and it is so for data audit auditable i said true by default so when i install my application the config for this and uh, entity for data audit auditable field will be set to true by default okay thanks to this i can configure entities and i don't need to add this additional field to every other entity that i would like to set if this is uh, auditable or not i have the namespace registered and data audit bundles then handles it okay so data audit bundles can check if given entity have this enabled or no and if this is enabled it should persist uh, the information that something was changed for example uh, as you can see i have different uh, for the ownership and for security we're gonna cover this next week and for many other and it's very simple you would like to add uh, if you would like to add your own configuration all you have to do is to create an ent entity config yam in oro directory and then you can create your namespace and add some fields as you saw here i have uh, for the entity but also i can define them for specific uh, single fields or columns so here for example for i have different annotations it's not config it's config field and i can set default values for import export for example set order so in which order this column will be exported to csv or i can said that this is auditable or i can for example disable something so i whenever i export i disable this specific column or i can say that this is your identity we're also going to cover this later okay so i don't need to add additional fields additional logics i can configure all the entities this way so here you can see for the contact if i go to the user entity it's a different conf as you can see and that audit is also true here and different config for the fields itself then you can here modify it here and see how it works and actually i will show you a demo in a second and there are comments and this is important to remember them you will not need them today or tomorrow but you will need them to if you would like to do the practice by yourself so the first command or entity config updates it reads the configuration so i've already created a contact entity and now i would like to change some field or i would add uh, sorry some uh, config field or i would ch uh, change value of config field it will not automatically reread it if i updated the annotation and the entity was already uh, there i need to execute bin console entity config update 
and it will get the information from the annotations and add it to the database. Which means that here in database, if I type for config, I have entity config and entity config field. So we could check it, for example. Let's find the class name for, usually you don't have to do this, but I will just show you how it works. I can find the contact entity, it's here. And here I will have the base64 coded configuration for this specific entity. So I could go to the unserialized com or any other, or can unserialize locally also, and check what is there. So I have the information about the specific configs, I have the relations, and all that was configured. So here, for example, if I look for data audit, I will find that data audit auditable is set to true. Okay, so this is how I can also check those values. And this is goes for the entity. And if I get this entity ID it's 66, and check in the entity config field, filter by 66, I can see all the fields for this specific entity. And for example, check the first name. As you remember, the first name was the identity for import export configuration. So let's check. I can also realize this, check import export, and those are the values. So I've read, sorry, not I, the application, read them from the annotation and then stored them in database. So whenever then I want to use them, they are here, they are also cached. So this will be really fast to use them. Mm. Then there are more comments. Cache clear, it will clear the cache. So as I told you, once it's update the database, it builds the cache. If I modify the database, I can clear the cache. And there is of course a cache warmup method. Uh, okay, let's see how it works. Uh, I will show you from the UI once again, you will do it with the migrations, you will do it with some queries to change those. You will you probably not do this by the UI, but I will just show you that the entity manager on the UI have the possibility to work with it. Uh, for example, we will enable attachments for the contact, and also we will enable auditable for the contact, okay? First of all, I will show you the contact entity. And as you will see, the last field here's was some contact count in and out. So let's open the training in the same tab. And here are the contacts. Let's go to the Debra. And I do not have attachments here. And now I will have the request from our management that right now in this specific moment, they need to add some attachment to the contacts, for example, to add some avatar or I don't know, family photo. I can go to the entity management, find the contact. And edit the entity enable the attachment. Here I can specify the MIME types or the size of the attachment. I can save it. And here you have the red button update schema because I need, I, this will create the real relation between the contact and the attachment table. So I can click the update schema. Again, usually you will not do it here. You will do it some CLI and you will have all the errors reporting. In case there will be any errors, I will just tell the logs right now and click the button. It's in the dev mode, so it will take a little bit longer than we would do this in the prod. Okay, the schema were update, was updated successfully. 
And now I can go to the contact view page, refresh it. And I will be able to add attachments. Okay, I have to have to pick the file, add some comment, and also there will be attachment section here. So I will see the files. I didn't have to do this manually. And here, if I refresh the oh no, sorry, it was the relation, so it will not work like this. But um, yeah, I'll show it an example in the second. Uh, and the same way, for example, works for data audit. Uh, as you saw, it was enabled for this contact. I can edit. And let's change the name. Let's call her Deb. I save it. And my change history will be empty. And this is because data audit is done asynchronously. This is not the information I need to know right now for the user. So the way the user should not wait for this to be processed. So right now, if I consume my uh, queue, it will process the information, it will store the data audit. And if I refresh, I will have the information, that John Patrick Doe, which is my admin user, changed the first name from Debra to Deb. Okay? And now, I would like to disable this, for example. So again, I find the contact entity. And edit. I said auditable to now. Save it. Refresh. The change history button is gone. As you remember, I had this check in the placeholder. So this button was added by the placeholder. And the placeholder, I had the condition if the entity is auditable. And now you see it works. Okay, so I didn't change any like, specific column in this entity. I changed its configuration. And based on this configuration, specific functionalities are enabled or disabled. So if I change the name again to Debra, It will not store the information. Actually, I will run the message queue. I see it's idle at the moment and still no there. I can enable this back. And this is quite important to understand that now I will enable that audit uh, again. The button will be restored and I will see the information that I had previously. So the information was not gone but the changes were not tracked when the data audit was disabled, okay? So I have the configuration. The fact that I set some configuration doesn't mean anything, but there is a data audit bundle which reads the, configura reads the configuration for this specific bundle and handles uh, its functionality of storing data audit or not. Okay, we're gonna talk about the extended entities in a moment. Guys, let's do like 10 minutes break right now and we'll continue. And once we're done with this, we will have a question and answers. And at the very end, I will give you the practice. You can do this yourself today or tomorrow morning, or you will see the solution tomorrow at the very beginning of the webinar. Okay, so 10 minutes break, guys. Thank you. Okay, guys, can we continue? Uh, so we talk about the Configuration of the entities, really nice feature. You can add your own namespaces or config keys. You can change the configuration and you can do this by changing the annotations or later on you can do this by changing the config with the migration. I showed, showed you where this is stored in database. So you can always take a look and pick what is inside the uh, configuration. But the easiest way would be to go to the backend of the application and there in the entity management as you saw you can check all the values and also i didn't show you but you can open specific field and here you will see the values 
you can edit them, but you can see what is configured for the import export. If this is auditable, it is available in the email templates on some other fields could be also here. And I've checked, uh, I will post the slides on the Slack channel, but also they will be included in the emails uh, after the webinars. Okay, so now let's talk about the second uh, thing. It's called extended entities. So, a few years ago, it wasn't that easy to extend the entity. So, for example, there is an entity, it belongs to the vendor, and you would like to add some additional fields to it. If this is not using like map superclass, it would be really not possible. You would have to overwrite it completely or replace it, do some tricks. And the idea of Foro was uh, the actually from the platform already, it was to make it easily extendable or configurable. So you saw how you can configure and now how you can extend the entities. So whenever you make the entity extendable, it's to add possibility to create custom fields or the relation to the existing entity. So of course, when you create the customization, you will create your own functionalities with your own entities, but in really every, or probably every project, you will have the request to add some additional field to customer, customer user, or to product. And because whenever you create a customization, Oro is a vendor for you, you cannot just go to the entity, add a uh, property, add some annotations, and that's it. You would have to create the migration for this, but then if you just add the column, the entity will not be aware about this column and it will be not uh, possible to store the data or persist it. Okay, so to extend the entity, you need to add the property, you getter and setter for this property in the entity, and then you need to bind it with the specific column in the migration. So you need to also uh, add this column to database. Okay, so to make the entity configurable, all you have to do is to add this config annotation. So once again, let's go to the contact, contact.php. And to make this configurable, all you have to do is add this config annotation. It can be empty at the beginning. It is enough to make the entity configurable. Okay, that's it. To make it extendable, you need to create a model, just an empty model. And in this case, it extends contact. And we always put it in the model directory. So you can see Oro bundle, contact bundle, model. Here we create some, it doesn't have to extend here, this is a very specific condition, usually it will be like this, just extend contact, and if the entity have the constructor, for example, to initialize some collection, then your model should call the parent constructor, that's it. This doesn't have any other implementation in other methods like here, because it will be then used as an intermediate layer to something we create in cache. Okay, and real class with your customization will be generated in cache. And this is why yesterday I told you that when we exclude cache from uh, indexing, we should de-exclude this one specific directory called Oro Entities. So here, if I go to cache and I go to Oro Entities, extend entity, here also I can use search. So I just start typing like contact and it will search for me and yeah, Oro contact bundle contact and here I already have some additional fields and we will see how to add more later on so my entity extends this model but then when we generate uh, everything actually it will extend this class from the cache so it will have access to its properties getters and setters okay so that this model is just like on the intermediate layer between those two and the real uh, parent class will be generated here in cache and it will be used. And so, some examples. We added those with the migrations. We're gonna talk about the migrations in a moment. And for example, I have a table and I would like to add some extended field. So this is the name, this is the type, and then we always have options. So in the options, by default, we set required, not null or something like this, or uh, length. And here we can also specify oral options. And the first link is the answer to the questions you asked uh, already in the question answer. And 
here you can see its extent. We set it to true because this is the extended field, but also we have a very uh, important field called owner. And in the scope, there are by default two owner types, owner custom and owner system. Owner custom means that there will be some, let's call it magic, added to this field, and this field be automatically added to the view, to the form, and it will be handled. If you set it as owner system, it means that you just want to add this field, but you will have full control over it. It will not be added to the form or the views unless you add it there with the extension, for example, like uh, form extension for the form or scroll data extension for the view. Okay, so this is very important field uh, whenever you add it. And rest of those, you already know from like 15 minutes ago because those are the config values. So whenever I create new field, I will not have this field in my entity. I will, yeah, it will not appear here. So I cannot add those annotations, but I can configure them here. So for example, data audit set to true. Uh, I can specify which form component should be used. Of course, it will be automatically added, but it will use this component. If this is, uh, it should be displayed on the view and if yes, in which type, for example. And if this should be displayed on data grid, so there's a, is visible and the second uh, parameter could be a filter. And I can set this is visible, but the filter uh, is not displayed. Okay, so this is how I add the field. Of course, you will see in a moment, I can also add it from the UI, but in the majority of cases, unless this is like, like request from the marketing that you have to do this at this very moment and you cannot deploy it and you know develop the normal way you could also uh, go with the, um, clicking this to the UI and the same way you can add relations so for example I have the user and now I created the job position entity and of course I would like to be able to assign the job position to the user but for this, I would have to create many to one relation from user entity to job position. And as we already said, user entity is in the vendor directory and you, you cannot just go there and modify it. You could patch it, of course, but this is never a uh, recommended idea unless you really have to, to patch the vendors. Uh, and otherwise, your changes will be gone whenever you reinstall uh, with Compose. Okay, so for this, we can add the relation very similar uh, way as we added the field. And for this, we just need to use something called extend extension. And all of this will be in a moment. So how can I add the relation? Again, we are inside the migration and we have the extend extension here. How is it here? We're gonna talk in a second. And I have add many to many relation. Again, if you would like to find what other relation you can add, Google is your friend, or a platform extend bundle relations. And it's here. And here I can see what are the limitations of this and what relation I can add. As you saw here, I'm adding, sorry, I'm adding many to many relation. So I can see that I have many to many unidirectional, bidirectional, and even bidirectional with the default entity. I can click it and I can see how it works. Also, of course, I can open this in IDE and have some pretty nice hints. So let's find this shopping list bundle installer. And search for many to many. Okay, and here I can click, and this is quite good uh, description. What are the parameters I'm going to use? So, I'm sorry. First of all, I need to pass the schema, which I have the access to in the migration. I need to pass from which table. So here, as you see, I took the table from the schema. So I have schema get table the name of the table. Then I need to create the association name. So here in this example, I'm adding the shopping list relation to the oral customer visitor table. So customer visitor is used for the customers that are not being registered. So you can go to oral commerce and do uh, see the shopping list without logging in. Those are customer visitors. And because they have access to shopping list, I need to have this relation. And so, I have the shopping list 
association name and then to which table this should uh, this relation should refer to then the fields uh, that should be used for the representation of those uh, columns and here you can see that the first one is to use the, as a title the second one is used for the detailed information and the target of the entity in the grid okay so which uh, column so usually you don't want to use ids here you want to use the columns that are like string like the first name last name username because those will be used not for the relation itself, like this is not used for the foreign key generation. It is just used to display the information later on if you set the owner to the custom. If you set the owner to the system, you will have to take care of displaying this by yourself. Okay? And then you can specify additional options. Here, actually, we saw that we set cascade to all. So this will persist and delete with the cascade. And okay, so the extent extension is the extension of the migrations, and there are a few. Like for example, we have attachment extension, we have territory extension, and those are to help you to create those relations or special click fields. So attachments will help you to create the relation to the attachment table or to create the file uh, fields. The extent extension is here mostly for the relation or for the enum fields for example mm, okay and how to use this extension all you have to do is to go to your installer or the migration we're gonna cover the differences in a second and implement extent extension our interface create the property to keep this extent extension and create a setter with this specific name actually if i remove it my interface will tell me that i need it okay so this is required by the interface and then whenever my uh, installer extend this extension the, there is a process that will call set extent extension and it will inject it for us okay so i will uh, have access to it and then uh, i can call all the methods that are available inside so even creating custom entity table uh, you will see this in a moment from the ui creating the enum fields this is something very nice uh, it's like the dictionary but you have mm, control over this so it's not like full crud but you have control and you can prioritize them through the ui later on and all the relations also so here later on yeah all the relations that were defined I will show you now that you can use this to the UI. And again, you will probably create those all by the migration. Okay, so right now my manager called me or the marketing department called me and say, hey, we need to assign favorite product to the contact, okay? By default, you would, uh, of course, create a migration, do the deployment, and have this uh, done. But I will show you how to do this from the UI perspective. We open the admin. Go to the entity management. As you remember, it was for the contact. No, excuse me. Contact. And I need one too many product relation. So I have edit, or actually no, create field. Field name, product. And so excuse me, one too many, yep. So here I have table column because I want to have this as a column, not just a serialized field, so I can then filter by this. And one too many. Okay, this is just the first step. This is field name, not the label. So uh, I recommend using, you know, the snake case, for example, and without any special signs or not from the big letters or uppercase. And then here we have the label and some description. We point to which entity we would like to create these relations. For example, product. If this is bidirectional or not, here by default it is bidirectional. And those are those additional uh, columns I told you about here in the 
See, so which should be used to generate the names. So let's say the SKU, here you can use SKU and status and detailed all three fields. Then for this relation, I can set the configuration, like right? because I have this uh, config value. So should this be visible on the form? Should this be vis visible on the view? So it's exactly the same. I was able to specify when I was creating a field. And for example, if this should be auditable. So let's save it. And before I click update schema, I will show you the, the contact in the cache here. Uh, we had the properties for the picture and for the last contacts information like that in, date out, count. Okay. So I will create the update schema. Again, it will really update the schema for me and create the relation. So let's proceed. Okay, it was done. So first of all, if I found contacts here right now. I can see that I have the fields products and this is relation one to many and I can edit or check it. And then if I go to the contact, open Debra. I can see that it was added to the view page. I have the information. Of course, I did not assign any products yet. And if I edit, I have the additional and here I have the products. This is many, so I can just add them using the... So here you can see the detailed right now, right? So uh, let's go back to the field. So to the relation definition. And you can see detailed information and the comment in the code said that this will be displayed in the data grid when you select. So you can see the information about the products here. I can sorry, select them. Here I have the information from the second field and I can store it and have them displayed as a link here. Okay, so I just have the SKU and, for example, this enabled. I could use, of course, different fields here. And what's also nice, as I told you, that uh, it is generated in cache. So right now you can see this cache class generated. It have the property, has the property products and setters and getters for this as a product. Okay, so now I can really edit this. I can do anything. So this works like I would have owner custom. If I would like to add it by myself, for example, use very specific form component, or I don't want to have it in the form just in the view because it should be set by some API calls, I will set owner to system and modify it myself, or I will keep owner custom. And then in the form, I would just set is enabled to false. So it will still be displayed automatically in the view, but I will have to uh, take care of myself of adding into the form. And if I decide, this was also the question in FAQ, as I remember, to add it automatically in the form and then to overwrite it in the form extension, I can do it in two ways. First of all, I can create a pretty simple entity config field value query, and then I will just change the value of this field configuration and set is enabled to false for the form the namespace and then I can add this field to the form extension or I would just straight add it to the form extension with the uh, option is dynamic field set to true otherwise it will put some conflict that I've added this to the extension and it was already added by dynamic field extensions okay so you saw that I did it through the UI but it actually generated the tables generated the relation in database 
and it generates the, the code, the class to set and get those properties. So right now, whenever I need to work with this contact in the code, I will have access to set or remove products, okay? So I can use it as I would have it inside my contact entity. And the same way you could create totally custom entity. Of course, this is like not very popular way because usually if you need custom entity, you are building some bigger functionality and you're gonna create this entity uh, the symphony way anyway. But I will just demonstrate you that there is such possibility. So I can go to the entity management. I can create the entity. Let's call it vehicle. Let's have some icon, or maybe the engine. Oh. And let's leave all uh, as defaults. Okay, and now the ID will be created automatically, so I should create only the additional fields. So let's call it name and it should be a string. I can define, for example, all the fields that I would define for typical properties of the entity. So all the or config field annotations. So import export or for example, auditable. Okay. Once I have the entity in the fields, I can add some additional fields and then click the update schema. What it does, it creates the table and also it creates the entity for it with all the properties and getters and setters to use this as any other entity. Okay, so actually I can open the database. I can refresh it, search for vehicle or extended vehicle. I see there is ID, there is a name and the serialized data. Serialized data would be added to the extendable entities because if some conditions are met, for example, this field is a string uh, or just number value and it doesn't have to be searchable in the backend or filterable, it is possible to create this field as a serialized data. So it will be not additional column, it will be just serialized and stored here in this uh, field with other serialized fields. And now I can use this entity. First of all, it generated the simple CRUD for me. So here under entity, I have the vehicle and this is very simple CRUD. So let's create some. I don't want to do any commercials here. So vehicle A. So excuse me. And vehicle B. And again, we can use it to create relations. So our contact now should be able to pick which vehicle they drive. So I open contact, I create a field. And now it's many to one. So many contacts can have the same type of vehicle as favored. Okay, label. Now I point to which entity, and as you can see, I have the vehicle already here. And it doesn't have to be the bidirectional, and it should point to the name. So I will see the name in the representation, the relation, the foreign keys are bind by the IDs, identifiers of those tables, and this is just to display the relation on the view. And I click update schema. So I would not be able to do this without extended uh, functionalities because as I have full control over a vehicle, I, would, I could create it inside my uh, bundle at any properties, any annotations and create the migration myself, of course. 
I do not have the access to contact, direct access to contact entities, so I would not be able to create many-to-one relation for, with contact as a owning site, which I did right now. So first of all, I can go to the contact. And I have favorite vehicle right now. I can edit. And there is a vehicle. And I can pick which I want, save it. And it's displayed here. And how does it look here? First of all, if I go to the contact right now, because it's many to one, there should be a key, right? The vehicle. And there it is, favorite vehicle ID. So it created the relation for me and created the column to store it. So as you can see, I set it only for Debra. And I have the key here. Also, it created, let me synchronize the cache. It created the class for the vehicle. So it's simple one, but it have the properties and it have the setter and getter for the names. And it modified the contact. Um, I have it here. To have a five root vehicle with the getters and setters for this, okay? So I modified the entity. Of course, I didn't modify the class uh, contact uh, entity itself. So whenever I install my vendors, I remove them and update the composer, whatever I do, I will not lose those changes. Those changes are stored in the database, in the field configuration. And also whenever we generate the cache, the class is generated for us. So our entity only extends some model, which then will be replaced with the real class generated in the cache. If we need to, change something with this cache generation, we have possibility to override those uh, cache generators, but this is like really detailed information and we are not going to cover this right now. Uh, usually you don't have to uh, go that far. In a moment, I will show you how you could do exactly the same uh, in the code. Okay, so you need to remember about two things. That, and it can be configurable. And for this, you need to add this annotation config and that's it. And of course you can provide some default values and the entity can be extendable. Not all of the entities are extendable. Some of them for the performance reason are not, but really majority, vast majority of them is extendable. And this you've seen already. And now we're gonna talk about the migrations. Uh, we're gonna do the quick question answers. I will show you the practice and this will be it. So we do not use the Symfony default migrations. We have our own way to use them uh, because we have those extendability uh, and configurability of the fields. The drawback of this is that we right now support only up migration. You will not have the possibility to revert them with down migrations. Okay, so this is thing that you need to remember. And this is why I recommend, first of all, do a backup before you run the migration, which of production you, of, of course, do anyway, but even locally just to, you know, save your time of restoring some if something went wrong. Uh, and also, you can, of course, execute the migration with the dry run and show queries flag. And this way, it will show you all the queries that should be executed. Okay. And so if we think about the migration, there are two things. The first is the installer which is what uh, queries should be executed when you install the bundle. And the second one is the migrations, which should be executed when you update it. Uh, so where do you put the installer? You already actually seen it. Uh, but let me switch the branch. I'm on this new branch right now and I will update the application in the background. So the comment I told you yesterday 
platform update, it will execute all the queries and everything for me. I can run it, but also you will see the part of the solution just briefly. So if I would like to add the installer of the, for the bundle, I create the migrations. Oh, actually, not synchronized yet. I create the migrations directory. Inside, I have two directories, data for the fixtures and for the demo data, and the schema for installer and the migrations. So the installer goes directly to the schema directory. It has to implement the installation interface, which will point to get migration version, okay? Because you need to know up to which version the installer is uh, updated. And if you will need some services, uh, you can, uh, for example, implement a container, uh, our interface. And usually you will need extend extension because you will create some relations, okay? So right now I have the installer and whenever this installer is executed, it will call, call up uh, migration. Uh, so first of all, how it works? How does it know uh, the application if it should execute installer or the migration? There are two tables, oral migrations and oral migrations data. First one is for the migrations, the second one is for the fixtures. So right now we are interested in the first one. Mm. Oh, <laughs> I forgot the switch force, which actually is good. So you can see right now uh, my migration with naming type was not executed yet. So I can look for it. There was, sorry, nothing like this yet. So let's execute this update. It checks the requirements the same way as it checks them during the installation. And then it processes the migrations. As you can see, there is more migration than just the my one. My one is here. And then after this migration is executed, it creates some other migrations, which actually just uh, sometimes even call the commands to refresh the cache, refresh the entity config, store the information about the migration and so on. So even if you do not have any migrations, all of those will be executed just to update all the information for you. So right now my migration was executed and here I have the information that the training username bundle is installed and it is in version 1.1. Version is taken from the installer. So this is the information stored. So whenever I update the application from now on, it will not execute the installer. It will check that the installer was already executed because there is a record in the ROM migrations. It will check the version and then it will go here to the schema go to the subdirectories and check if there is any newer than the current installed. So right now, if I would create, sorry, it will execute the migration from this one because it's newer than uh, the one stored in database. And it will add the record here that now it is in version 1.2, okay? So this is uh, how it finds out if to run installer or the migration. Our recommendation is to always update the installer to the current migration version. So, of course, you could just have the installer at the very beginning and then just go on only with the migrations. It is not the best way for a few reasons. First of all, let's assume that I created the comment field and I set it to be a text, okay? Of course, after some time, there, there was a complaint that the comment is only 200, uh, sorry, it was a varchar. It was only 255 characters long and I want to have it longer. So of course I would create a migration and change the type from varchar to text, for example, or some other type, okay? To store longer values, sure. Now I run the update, the migration is executed because the installer was executed before and the field type is changed. Excuse me for a moment. But the idea of the installer is also to just install the last version. So if I would just 
if I had the application installed previously, I run the migration, it's fine. But for example, we have new team member joining the team and he will just install the application from the scratch. What is the point of him setting the field or for the application to set the field to the string and then change it to the text? It should execute only the installer, which should install the bundle in this final form. So the installer should be updated. So let's look like here. I create some table and for example, this was a string. I want to change it. So I create a migration that changes it to the string. But then in installer, I also, sorry, change it to the type. In installer, I change it to the type, to the text again, and update the information that right now installer works, uh, is up, updated to the migration 1.2. So whenever I install the bundle, I will go with the installer. The installer is uh, updated to 1.2. So he will just check if there are any migration after 1.2 because if I wouldn't uh, update the installer version and there will be migration 1.3, whenever I install it from the scratch, I will execute the installer first always and check if there are any migration newer than the installer version. So I will install this one and the migration from the 1.3 directory, okay? So it's not like you have to update the installer, but this is a good idea. Thanks uh, to this, you will just open this file and you can check the final structure of the data for this uh, bundle. Otherwise, you have to open all the migration and check the changes. So here you open and you know what tables uh, should look like. And also, you will not uh, execute the things that you don't have to execute, like for example, changing the type. You will just set the type to the correct one from the very beginning. Okay, so this is how it should look on the diagram. You add additional migrations. So if I install the bundle when it was uh, in version 1.1, I call the update, it will just execute migration 1.2. But if I install it from the scratch, it will only execute the installer. So it will, you know, it's easier to make mistake if you do all those changes. And uh, you just install the final version and it's very simple to read it. So, Installer contains the version. It should be the latest one. This is the, what we recommend and prefer. And set up the DB schema for a bundle. So whenever we execute installer, we actually execute the app method. And the app method have access to the schema and to the query back. So on the schema, we work with the schema, with the tables, we add the columns, we create the tables, we set the keys, add some primary keys and so on. And for the queries, we can add some additional queries, for example, to move some data and so on. So for the query back, you actually have two methods. It will show three, but one is just an alias. And ask post query, pre query, and query. And as I remember, ask query is just an alias to add post query. Yeah. So add query is the same as post query. So post queries are executed after all the schema changes, and pre queries are executed before them. Okay, so it depends if you want to do something with, for example, the data before or after the upgrade. For example, before upgrade, you might move them to some temporary column. After changing the column, you move them back and so on. As you can see, we do not work with ORM. Yeah, we work on the schema. You do not have uh, any entities or any uh, anything connected to RM at this moment, okay? It will work uh, only with the fixtures later on. And then we have the migrations. They are very similar to the installer, but the idea is just to change database schema, not to set up. Uh, the same way it contains queries in the extension. So let's open the migration. As you can see, we implement different interface. It's called migration interface. The extent extension, our interface is exactly the same. So we have the property and we have the setter. And in the app method, we have access to schema and the queries exactly the same way as we did in the installer. Also, as you can see, we do not return any version here because the migration version is taken from the directory the migration belongs to. Okay, so this migration is one point, version 1.1. So it's really important 
I know that some, <laughs> you will copy paste some of the migrations just to have the scaffolding. Just be sure you change the namespace. Otherwise you, you might mess it up or it will not be executed because your application will already be in that version. Uh, again, you can have pre-queries and post-queries. That's what I said. And also there is something called uh, ordered migration interface. So here I can implement ordered migration interface and I can set some order. So if I will have few uh, migration in this specific directory, I can decide in which order they will be executed. For example, I have some logical div uh, division between them and I want one to be executed before the other one. So this interface, we just have the method get order. That's it. And if I would like to load the migrations and not all the upgrade, I just execute our migration load uh, command. So, oh, yeah, very good. Before you run the update, you should always clear the cache just to avoid any mistakes. Uh, so, bin console, oro migration load. I can execute it because as with the update, it will not be executed without force flag option. And minus help will show me that I can use the dry run and I can use the show queries. So if I have both of those flags, it will just display the queries that will be executed during the migration without really executing it. So it's really good to check if I did not so dummy mistakes. And During this example, as I remember, yeah, this is for example, how you can create some specific queries. Like I created the query using the parameter as SQL migration query, and I can execute the query in this case, post migration. So after the migration execute. And the one that is really important for you is this one. Let's open this in IDE. So as I said, when you set the config in the annotations, then you can modify it with the migrations, right? Or when you set it in the UI, you can still modify it. And for this, we have entity config field value query. It's already there, so let's find the usage of it. Um, okay, so it won't be here. Let's, yeah, let's see the hint. So I just run it new. I specify for which entity I want to modify it. Here actually I, it was in the loop because I wanted to modify a few fields. But for example, let's say IDE, then I define which namespace. It can be, for example, form, which field like is enabled, and to what value I want to modify, right? So as you remembered in this uh, hash, we had all those fields defined in the annotations. So let's open the contact. And I would like to modify this auditable value for the name prefix, right? So I would call this migration. Here I will have the contact class. The field will be name prefix. The namespace will be data audit. The field name will be auditable. And the value is Boolean, so it will be false in this case, okay? So this way I can modify the value that was already set, for example, through the UI. Okay, so this is how I modify. There is more of those uh, queries ready for you. There is a different one to modify the entity uh, field, entity config, sorry, because this is for the uh, field config, they're separate for the entity field, for example. Okay, let's continue. And the last part for today is how we work with the demo data fixtures. Uh, so as I told you at the very beginning, in this migration directory, we have the schema where we have the installer and the migrations. And the second directory was called uh, data. And this is where we put the migrations. And there are two types. The one that are loaded always, for example, user roles, and the one that are loaded only if you set the uh, load demo data to true. Uh, when you install the application, I think you remember there was a question to load demo data or not. So demo data is something that should not go into the production. So 
there are fixtures that you need always, like for example, uh, product units uh, or uh, user roles. And there are also fixtures that you only need to present your application, how it works for the user during the development or some other demonstration. So this is called demo data. So how it works. Uh, you need to put them in the correct directory. The name is not important. So this is the fixture. You can extend the abstract fixture and then you load them with the similar command but migration data load. This one doesn't need the force switch because it's a little bit safer than executing the migration. So uh, it will be executed. If you want uh, to install the demo data, you have additional, excuse me. Oh yeah, skip this one. <laughs> Sorry for this. Uh, so first of all, we are using the doctrine data fixture for this and usually they do not have version. It's because once you load the products, for example, uh, fixtures or the unit fixtures, you do not want to reload them. There are some conditions that you want to update the fixture, which can be, for example, email templates. So I have some email template for welcoming a registered user, and later on I want to change it. So it is possible. All you have to do to, is to go to your fixture and implement version fixture interface. It will just ask you to get the version, and I here return the version. Whenever this version is newer than the one stored in database, it will reload this fixture. If you have this interface, you, all, uh, you need to remember that it can be called when this uh, record already exists. So we need to think, uh, have the logic if you want to update the record or to create the new one. Otherwise, you can create some uh, unique exception, for example. So it's very nice uh, feature this, uh, to, have, to be, have possibility to update the fixtures but you need to think about the consequences that you don't want to record the same record twice. And also, as you remember, there was the second table called oral migrations data. Uh, it stores all the class name of the uh, fixtures that were executed. So whenever this fixture is executed, as you see, it was executed half an hour ago, and it just stored the class name here without the version because when I executed, it wasn't version. So it will not execute this uh, fixture again because it's already there. So whenever I execute migration data load comment, it will go through the, all the fixtures, get the class names, check if they were executed. If not, it will execute them. So if I would like to execute this again, I could copy this with different class name, for example, or I could make it version. If the fixture is version, he will check the class name, but also he will check this additional column version. And if the version is lower than the version in the fixture file, it will execute the fixture again. And also you can use ordered. It was the, exactly the same as for the migration, but the nice feature is dependent. So if you, for example, want to use, uh, load users, you probably want to load them after loading user roles because you would like to assign the roles to the users already. So this is why you use dependent uh, interface. Dependent fixture interface. Actually, let's see what we implemented. And See, it's implement dependent feature interface and have the dependencies. Here, you can have the whole class name or of course use the shorter notation with, it works the same. So it will build all the dependencies for all the fixtures and then execute them in correct order. So the fixture that other are dependent on will be executed pure to them. Okay, so for example, if you will load the business unit and roles first, and then he will load the user data. So dependent fixtures is really important if your fixture should be loaded after some other fixture, and this other fixture is not part of your bundle, so you cannot just use order, uh, ordered fixture. <laughs> then back to the slide with demo data. 
this is exactly same picture they look exactly the same the difference is that you put them in the demo subdirectory so here I would create the demo next to ORM and inside I will create ORM and then the fixtures for the demo data. What is important also here, as you can see, here I work with the object. I do not use the class names, I'm using, uh, sorry, the column names. I'm using the classes and the properties. Okay, so I have access to the ORM and to the entities. So for the fixtures, we go uh, different than for the migration because we do not work with the schema uh, structure here, we work, we work with the data. So for the demo data, I can load them during the installation. If I want to change my mind and want to load them later on, I execute the same command as I would do with the typical fixtures, but with the switch fixture types equal demo. This is documentation for you. And tomorrow we will start from data grids. Right now, guys, uh, I think we can have like 10 minutes question answer session and I will give you the practice. If you can, if you have if you feel like you want to, you can try to do this practice by yourself and tomorrow you you can compare the solution because I will present the solution tomorrow at the beginning of the webinar. And okay, so question answers right now. Oh we have 16. Uh, Freddy, when should I use parent? Uh, I think this is uh, related to the view that we extended. So here I wanted to use parent because I didn't want to override whole breadcrumbs. I just wanted to add something. So if I comment this and okay, it won't and go to the users. I will not extend the block, I will overwrite it, okay? So I lost everything that was in the parent template and just have my own block there. So this is when you can use parent. If you want to have what is in the parent template and you just want to add some additional stuff before or after the template. See, I still I have it back. Uh, can you show us a bit of the view render process insights? Um, I'm not sure what you would like to see, Marcos. Please pause the question uh, in the Slack channel and we can continue the discussion there. Uh, Alexander, uh, how can I run specific job from the jobs batch? Uh, Alexander, we're gonna cover the jobs uh, during the import export and this will be on the day four, so it will be next Tuesday. And then I will try to answer your question, okay? Marcos, sorry for the late question. Can you expand on what is compiler pass? Okay, so compiler pass is a code that is being executed. Actually, depends how we define it. Uh, after the dependency injection container was built, and then you can modify it. For example, you can change the class name, as some method calls, work with the tags, and for example, create some registry. So this is a way to modify the uh, dependency injection container after it's already built from all the services yams. Okay. What data grid is visible means on the oral option. Please one example. Uh, okay, so for example, uh, I have this vehicle here, right? If I go to the context uh, grid, I see that the vehicle is, first of all, it is visible here in the options, and also it's already enabled. So I should be able to see it somewhere, and it's here, okay? This is means that it is visible. The possible option is visible, is uh, hidden, is configurable visible, or is hidden and not configurable. So if I, for example, go and change these values right now. So go to the contact.
and find the value. Stop. And here I have the day. Add to the grid settings. Show the filter now. Um, I think this is the one. I always work with the migration notes from here, but let's try it this way. And Roberto, is there a clean way to delete fields added by a migration to an entity? Also for those with relationship. So you should remove them uh, as a columns. And also there is a remove field query and that you use the same way as it, uh, the query to update the configs. And it is a little bit more complex with the relationships. I will not uh, cover this right now. And the vehicle is gone, okay? So it is hidden from the database. So Freddy, this is what is visible means. So there are two things, is visible and the filter. So if first one, defines if this is visible and if this should even appear here in the option. So if you can make it visible, if you configure. And the second one, if the filter should be created for this or not. Marcos, why use an installer instead of nice migration? So as I said, for the readability of your code. If you have migrations, you will create additional field or additional table or in new files in the new version. So then if you would like to check what is the structure of this specific bundle, you would have to open all those files and in your mind connect those fields with the, uh, to the tables and you will see the structure. If you have the installer and this is updated to the current version, you will just open this and you will see what tables do you create, what fields they have, what uh, uh, keys, do you have for indexes everything so this is really easy and also in migrations for example you can change the type and override and there is no point when you install the application from scratch to do this over and over again you should just insert the final version of the database structure when you created a field via administration how can i deploy it so akavicha as i said as a developer it's better always to do this with the migration when you created this field via the uh, UI, it is stored only in database. There is no sign for it in the code except the cache. So whenever you want to move the application and you want to have this field, you will have to move it with the database. Or create the migration that will check if this field already exists and if not, create it. Okay, so it would be possible to create this field for the UI because you needed it quickly and then create the migration that would create this field if it's not already in database. So uh, when you create a column in the migration, before you add column, you can, for example, have has column, okay? So I can check if the of course, ID is not a good example. If ID is not there, and only then create it. So I could do this from the UI and then add the migration that would create the same field with the same settings I had in the UI if it's not already in database. Uh, Beamers. It's not recommended to make entity changes to the UI since it would not be portable when deploying to another environment. That's correct. This is why, uh, well, it will be portable if you would move database, but this is why I recommend uh, to always create those changes with the entities or with the migrations. So then you just move the code base and the database structure will be correct because it will be recreated from the migrations. But sometimes there will be urgent, urgent need to add this field. You can do this through the UI. You can fix this later on by adding the migration that will just do what I saw here in the ID. Pedro, how can we add a custom method into the extended entity? Like for the new field, I want to add this new method into, so 
the setter and getters methods will be generated automatically. And if you need some uh, different fields, you will have to create cache generator extension. We're not gonna cover this. Uh, you can try to uh, take a look in the code. So th those are cache generators and you can create extension for them. And this extension you could, we use for them, for example, to implement some interfaces to existing entities, but also you could create custom methods with it. Uh, Marcos, why create entities using admin if you can trust the user and don't have any code to customize? Uh, Marcos, I showed this as an example. Usually, really, there is a very small edge case where you will do this from the UI. Always, you should create the entities uh, locally in the code. Also, if you can create entity like the Symfony way, you should do this because this entity will always be faster than the one generated in code. Sorry, in cache. Okay, so you use extended functionality. If you need to extend the entities, you cannot modify by yourself. If this is your entity, you should create those normal fields, normal relations with the doctrine annotations and use them symphony way. If this, if you are extending uh, the or, or ex uh, entities, then you don't have this possibility and you go with the extended uh, fields. Marcos, what does set extension uh, do. So this is just the method that is being called uh, for all the installers or migration that implement this extend extension our interface and it will just inject this extension for you. So later on you can use it to create the relation. So again this you don't need this extension in your installer if you just create table and add some columns. You will need it to create the relation of for example enum fields. How can, create a, how can you create a migration for auto-incremented field with starting value? Uh, I would create the field and then I would create post query to set the auto-incremented value. I think I would go with this way. Roberto, the update entity config field value query is the way to modify the entity fields to avoid to add it automatically in the extension. Uh, no, no, the update entity config field query, it's nothing to do with the form extension or type extension. This updates the value. So the, you asked before, you shouldn't do this to the UI. Yeah, so if you want to modify it, for example, uh, later after the entity was already down, or if somebody modified to the UI, you can do this using this in the migration. So you create a migration, you add the query using this entity config field value query and update the uh, field config. So for example, auditable. Okay, so there are two. One is for the entity config and the second one is entity field config. Uh, okay. Can you have different names for fixtures? So instead of demo, it could be free directories name uh, yeah, it's not that very simple one. You you just need to customize a fixture loader a little bit, but this is like half an hour cust uh, customization. And then yes, uh, we already have this for a few clients. So demo data fixtures are perfect if you want to use uh, or out of the box or customize a little bit. Later on, you can add some fields to the products or orders that are required, for example. Uh, they, are, they are not in the demo data. And actually you will not be able to load the demo data anymore because they will fail because they miss some required information. And this is when you actually can create your own demo data by uh, changing the fixture loader. Should we run all commons be? Uh, so Marcos, you don't have to remove the cache all the time. Once you uh, work with or a little bit, you will uh, fully understand when you have to do this or not. Always you have to do this when you, for example, add a new uh, bundle. It's uh, really recommended before running the migrations or running the platform update. Before the uh, fixtures loading, like you give the example, you don't have to do this, for example. Can we change the behavior so that bin console nukes more cache on its own? Um, I'm not sure you want to do this, uh, I think you for this you will write a uh, bash script, for example, like I have for the XDebug. 
Santiago, the out of the box CRUD only generates from admin, or you can create with migrations. <laughs> no, so if you have custom entity and this is your entity in the code, uh, you will create, you will have to create CRUD by yourself, and we're gonna cover this a little bit uh, tomorrow. But you can also create with the migration the custom entity. It's part of the other member extend extension. Here it was create custom entity table, and this one will have the CRUD as you would go with the UI. But just please remember this is like the very basic CRUD. Uh, Farzam, how can I do join in DQL to a field which is added via migration? You have full control over this field, so it is a property of your uh, class, so you just join it as any other field. Uh, okay, guys, all the questions answers, answered. Now I will show you the practice, and this will be it for today. So, <coughs> this practice has two parts, because the theory has two parts. We have finished it up to the migration, so we only <coughs> will go with the first part of the practice. So, please create the configurable and extendable entity. Remember, to make it configurable, you add the annotation config, uh, do the entity annotations. To make it extendable, you create this model and extend it with your entity. This entity should be called username type and it should have fields ID, title, and the format with the specific properties. Please create an installer. So you have the entity and then you create an installer which should create database for this entity. So create a table, add the columns, set the uh, key and then you should create a second migration which will add extended many to one relation from user entity to user naming type so this is where uh, usually you get it wrong you need to add the relation to the user not to your new entity so the user it will be the only site and Make sure this is rendered. So if you make the migration and this is not rendered, please check if you have correct owner. So to make it automatically added to the view and to the edit, you want to use uh, owner custom. And the second part is to create a fixture and load it. So you actually seen a part of this because I was showing this as an example of this Fiori. So if you feel like uh, having some practice, or having some fun, Please try to do those two things. And tomorrow I will start from showing you the solution step by step. And we will continue the topic about the entities. Okay. So I will just take a last check of the chat. And if there are no questions, is there a way to clean the fields added by the migration? Yeah, Roberto, I have already answered this. Uh, okay, guys, I think that's it for today. Thank you very much for joining and talk to you tomorrow. And have a great day or evening, depends where you joined from. Bye-bye.